Well, good morning, everyone. It is the first Monday in November, and it's our next uh, EMX uh, symposium from, uh, from Stanford. And uh, two great speakers today are Roger Kornberg from Stanford itself, and uh, Hamish Fraser from The Ohio State University is one of the most internationally well-known electron microscopists and who's influenced many countries. Uh, so, uh, as always, we will uh, start uh, with the biology speaker, and so I'll hand the baton over to Professor Wa Chu, uh, who will do the introductions, and uh, Roger Kornberg will tell us for, first about his work. Wa? Thank you, Bob. Uh, it's my great uh, privilege today to introduce our speaker, Professor Roger Kornberg, the Mrs. George A. Windsor Professor of Medicine at the Stanford Medical School. Roger is a well-known biologist who have pioneered and detailed all the molecular events in transcriptions, which is a key process in life. Uh, his creative and innovative work uh, in, in purifying a tens of different proteins associated with this biological process has won him the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2006. And in reading his uh, publication, it's really fascinating how he was able to design many clever experiments and to delineate this complex process. In his work, Roger also utilized the structural tool extensively particular X-ray crystallography and, and electron microscopy. He is one of the early adopters of the cryo-EM in uh, resolving very large and complex structures uh, of the transcription complex and associated proteins. And in the last few years, uh, he has been turning his uh, attention in studying even more complex system, namely the chromosome by cryo electron microscopy and tomography. It's my great pleasure to have you here, Roger, uh, speaking to us uh, from Shanghai, which is really late hours for you. We thank you very much. Please, Roger. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. And it is indeed my pleasure uh, to uh, have this opportunity to tell you about our work today. Uh, and uh, I will share screen and uh, connect with the presentation. And uh, I expect that uh, you can now see the first slide, uh, which is the title or the subject of the talk. Indeed, I will speak today about uh, cryo EM tomography of human chromosomes. And this is the work of one second, let me make sure this can advance, of Maya Azubel. Her work was made possible by previous studies of Andrew Beal and Pierre-Jean Matai on chromosome structure. Uh, Maya's work was recently published in Molecular Cell. The uh, foundational studies of Andrew Beal and PJ Matai have not yet been published. We've investigated the problem of chromosome structure, and in particular, the structure of the mitotic chromosome, which as you know, is the most condensed state of the chromosomal material, a state in which one meter of DNA is condensed some 10,000 fold in length in the mitotic chromosome. Uh, the structural study of mitotic chromosomes and of chromosomes in general has proved difficult uh, the problem has proved refractory to conventional methods. So X-ray diffraction of mitotic chromosomes has revealed no repeating or periodic order. And electron microscopy uh, has been impossible due to the thickness of the mitotic chromosome, typically about a micron, certainly in the case of the human chromosomes that we've examined and which I'll speak about today. Uh, therefore, we turned uh, in the first instance to a chemical approach, we began by investigating the forces responsible for chromosome condensation. Uh, in this work of Andrew Beale and PJ Matai, uh, we observed isolated mitotic chromosomes under various solution conditions. 
and especially Andrew developed computational procedures for a quantitation of the condensation behavior. Hey, Roger, your slide. Okay, good. In this work, in this work, individual mitotic chromosomes were adsorbed to specially coated glass slides and observed by light microscopy, all the while being perfused with solutions of various composition. Here you see an example of a human HeLa chromosome perfused with a dilute solution containing only five millimolar tris buffer and two millimolar potassium chloride. This resulted in a tenfold increase in area on the, gl on the glass slide, as you can see uh, to the right of the more condensed chromosome on the left. Now, swelling of chromosomal material is not new. It's long been known that chromosomes swell and contract upon lowering and raising the ionic strength of the solution. But such observations have been made in the past on masses of chromosomes from mitotic cells uh, in almost every case, and the observations have invariably been only qualitative. Uh, we wished to make precise measurements on individual chromosomes and obtain accurate quantitative information. In the example shown here, we measured the length to width ratio of many HeLa chromosomes, either unswollen in the presence of the naturally occurring polyamine spermidine, the vertical axis on the right, or swollen in the absence of spermidine, the horizontal axis. A plot of these ratios has a slope of one, which is to say the length to width ratio is constant throughout swelling which means swelling is isotropic. It occurs equally in all directions. In this example, the chromosomes were imaged with a fluorescent dye, which we later learned to avoid because we found that dyes themselves can cause condensation. Instead, in the slides to follow, in all the slides to follow, we image chromosomes using differential interference contrast optics, thereby imaging the chromosome material directly. Following decondensation, as indicated at the bottom of the slide, in five millimolar tris and two millimolar potassium chloride, chromosomes could re be recondensed by the addition of 375 micromolar spermidine in this case, again shown at the bottom of the slide. Remarkably, the process of decondensation and recondensation could be repeated over and over again. Here you see the results of seven cycles of the additional addition and removal of spermidine. In such experiments, perfusion was performed very slowly over a long period of time. In order to record the behavior of individual chromosomes over long periods, we had to contend with instrument drift, with inhomogeneous elimination, with fluctuations in the lamp output, other sources of movement and variation of intensity. What is more, the outlines of decondensed chromosomes were barely visible, which posed a challenge for automated data collection and processing, which was essential for recording and averaging the behavior of hundreds of individual chromosomes to obtain statistically significant results. Andrew Beale wrote thousands of lines of codes uh, of code to correct for spatial and intensity variation. And he solved the problem of image recognition in the fully decondensed state. These automated procedures allowed Andrew and PJ to collect hundreds of thousands of images, followed by correction for spatial and intensity variation, particle picking, and accurate determination of areas of chromosomes in even the most decondensed states. Here you see plotted the degree of condensation as a function of spermidine concentration in the panel at the top for successive cycles of decondensation and recondensation. And you see the recondensation behavior is exactly the same every time. The plots are superimposable. The bottom of the slide, you see plotted the endpoints for fully condensed and fully decondensed states. You see that the degrees of condensation of fully condensed 
and fully decondensed states are virtually identical for every cycle. We conclude then that to the resolution of our analysis, chromosome condensation in this manner is reversible. The recovery of the starting morphology of the chromosomes following decondensation to 10 times the starting size and recondensation is really remarkable. The chromosome doesn't recondense to a formless mass, but rather to its original size and shape. Maya Azuel then sought to exploit partial decondensation in this controlled and reproducible manner to prepare chromosomal material in a state of sufficient thinness for electron microscopy. Our goal was to trace individual chromatin fibers and thereby to discover the patterns of folding or coiling responsible for chromosome condensation. Maya performed data collection with serial EM software and the things uh, to know here are the pixel size of 1.34 angstroms, electron dose of 60 electrons per angstrom squared. Maya used IMAT for reconstruction of the tomogram and she tried EMAN2 for automatic segmentation. But as I will explain, automatic segmentation didn't work. This slide shows two slices of the tomogram at the edge of a chromosome, the boundary of which is marked in red. We were really stunned by these first images. Nucleosomes, individual nucleosomes are clearly visible. The linker DNA between them is often visible as well. Nuclear nucleosomes are seen in both edge views as double disks uh, due to two turns of the DNA superhelix. And they are also seen on FAS as circles at various points in the image. As I mentioned, Maya attempted segmentation by EMAN2 with a convolutional neural network trained on both edge and face views. And here, the edge view is shown in pink, uh, the face view in cyan and the DNA between the nucleosomes uh, as segmented by EMAN2 in yellow. Segmentation uh, failed to identify all the edge and face views, but what is worse, it failed to identify linker DNA passing through multiple slices of the tomogram, as well as producing artifacts such as false connectivity and dangling ends such as illustrated or noted here by the asterisks, the red asterisks. The problem of linker DNA passing through multiple slices represents one of the major challenges to tracing chromatin fibers, and it is one of the reasons why such tracing has never been accomplished in the past. Maya illustrates in the next slide the problem and the way in which uh, she solved it. Uh, so on the left here, you see a green arrow to indicate a direction perpendicular to a slice of the tomogram. The red barbell symbolizes a nucleosome or two nucleosomes with a linker between them lying in the plane of the slice. The green barbell, a pair of nucleosomes with a linker between them lying uh, out of or crossing the plane. Then in, a, in an image of the slice in the direction indicated, shown on the right, the red linker is readily traced, but the green linker appears as a small dot, as I will show you in actual images. So Maya addressed the problem by a partial tilt, which is shown here. And when that was done, then the green dot became more apparent and could be clearly identified as DNA. In this movie, which I will have to get my cursor to activate, just be patient for a moment. In this movie, Maya goes from slice to slice and notice the green dot and whoops, and then another slice, it extended, and then and yet another slice extended further. And in this way, she could begin to trace out the path of the DNA. This slide, or I should say this movie, shows actual density for the linker, which was previously represented by a green dot. Oh, sorry, I failed to advance the slide. Let me try again, excuse me. 
this movie will show uh, the actual, it's not a movie, it's an animated slide, I beg your pardon, shows the actual density. You can see on the right, that is density between two nucleosomes, which appear in an image of a slice to be unconnected to one another and to possess no linker between them. However, Maya could see, she showed that on passing from a stack of slices, numbers 105 to 115, to the stack 110 to 120, density connecting the two nucleosomes became clear. Maya painstakingly traced an entire region of the tomogram in this way. Um, here's a movie to illustrate or begin to illustrate her work. So the movie begins passing slice by slice down through the tomogram from top to bottom. Maya selects a region of its contrast, centers it and zooms in. And then uh, she docks manually nucleosomes in the slices through this region that you will see in a moment. Here is uh, the beginning of docking nucleosomes. She does this in sets of 20 slices, slabs as it were, through the region. Uh, she also traces the linkers as I have just described. She arrives at a 3D picture of all the fibers producing, producing one slab or one set of slices, one set of 20 slices. That way she obtains a 3D image of that slab, that set of 20 slices. And then she repeats the exercise, as you will see in the continuation of this movie, for additional sets of 20 slices. The movie will show some further examples of docking nucleosomes manually, tracing the linkers manually as well, obtaining complete connections of all the nucleosomes that were docked in the set of slices or in the slab. And uh, at the end, uh, Maya will arrive at a complete 3D structure of the entire region. Now, viewing three of the, oops, I again made the mistake, sorry, I have to stop this. Viewing three of the fibers, just by way of example, in isolation from all of the rest for clarity, seen best in this slide, it is apparent there is no regular organization. Indeed, there could be no, Maya could discover no regular organization or particular pattern of any fiber. Some of you may know that uh, a number of very regular structures have been proposed or imaged in reconstituted material, not natural chromatin as in the chromosome we examine here, in experiments done both by crystallography and by cryoelectron microscopy. But none of those published structures could be discovered in the actual mitotic chromosomal material. Because of the plethora of these published structures, the question is often asked which represents, properly represents the higher order structure of a chromatin fiber. And the answer is there is no higher order structure. There is no regular order of chromosomal material in chromosomes beyond the nucleosome. Now, one may ask whether there might have been a regular structure before partial decondensation, which was necessary to allow imaging. Uh, this next movie addresses the question. Uh, it does so uh, by showing on the left, uh, these are positions of nucleosomes which were uh, identified uh, by template matching, subtomal averaging, and mapping back to the tomogram. The red rectangle is the region that Maya tr manually traced. On the right, you see that superimposed on an image of the actual density of the region. The bright yellow regions are regions of particularly high density. And you'll see up here on the left now, regions of the fibers that Maya traced. And on the right, those regions encircled and they include regions of particularly high density. We continue here slabbing all the, uh, going slice by slice all the way through. The point being that the regions that contain those fibers are of a density comparable to, so a density of about 20% 
comparable to the densities of the previously reported, the published so-called higher order fibers. Uh, it is evident that uh, a, a reduction in density due to decondensation could not account for a loss of structure had it occurred. So, sorry, once again, let's see if I can get to the next slide. Here's another view of the region that Maya segmented in its entirety, uh, without the linkers, just for clarity. This region contains a total of 520 nucleosomes, every one of which is connected through linker DNA to two neighbors, except those at the boundaries, of course. Each color represents a separate fiber traced through the entire tomogram, and there are 18 such fibers, which range in length from 10 to 51 nucleosomes. For ease of viewing, the linker DNA is not shown, but I would emphasize the average length of linker, Maya measured about 44 base pairs, is virtually identical to the length of linker determined by biochemical studies in a completely independent manner, again attesting to the validity of Maya's analysis and the uh, fidelity to the native state. Uh, Maya is now uh, undertaking the identification of specific DNA sequences within the tomograms in order to determine the 3D structures of actual, if particular, chromosomal regions at this level of detail, and of course, to trace the fibers well beyond uh, the limits of the tomogram shown here for any distance one may wish along the chromosome. Uh, I included a slide with Maya's name and her email address because she's best able to answer any questions that you may have, and she would be more than happy to do so. But in the remaining time, I would like to return to the work of Andrew Beale and PJ Matai uh, because uh, it is uh, so beautifully consistent with the conclusion from Maya's work. I'll only present a part of the further work by Andrew and PJ. Uh, it would take too long to present in full detail. It's indeed detailed, even the part that I will describe, but bear with me, you will see the simple conclusion that it leads to and the point as it relates to Maya's work at the end. So here what you will see are recondensation profiles for a series of linear amines. Not only spermidine, which I have spoken of, which is in blue, but also spermine, putrescine, and methylamine. Spermidine has three positive charges. It is a trivalent cation and neutral pH. Spermine, a tetravalent cation, putrescine, divalent, methylamine, monovalent. Each data point recorded here by Andrew and PJ represents an average of at least 208 and as many as 504 individual chromosomes. Each data point represents such an average. The lines through the points are binding isotherms. They are least squares fits to the Hill model from which apparent dissociation constants of the amine compounds may be derived. The logarithms of these binding constants, of course, correspond to binding energies. And you see here, they are linearly dependent on the charge of the amines. Not at all surprising, with the exception of the monoamine, methylamine, which is also expected. A monoamine is not, uh, uh, one would not anticipate that it would bind to the chromosomal material because, of course, monovalent ions don't form ion pairs. They remain separated from one another in aqueous solution. Now let me explain why this analysis is so significant and how it relates to Maya's work. Uh, the, uh, the connection that comes through the theory of condensation for an ionic hydrogel, which was developed uh, to a significant extent by Paul Flory, the legendary polymer chemist from the Department of Chemistry at Stanford many years ago. Uh, the theory was experimentally tested by 
many physical chemists over a period now of 70 years, a very well-established theory. The uh, previous work was first done on relatively simple systems. Andrew performed the extraordinary feat of adapting the theory to the condensation of chromatin. The basic idea is very simple. Swelling is driven by osmotic pressure indicated at the top, which draws water into the gel, continues to do so until the pressure falls to zero. The osmotic pressure is due to three parts, the tendency of the material naturally just to dissolve in the aqueous solution, and the chromosomal material will swell for that region, reason. That's the mixing term at the top. To the attraction of ions uh, from the solution to neutralize the charge on the hydrogel, which I've already mentioned, that's the ionic term. And finally, elasticity of the gel provides an opposing force, which balances the other two components at equilibrium. At equilibrium, when of course the osmotic pressure is zero and the system ceases to change. Now, there are closed form theoretical expressions for each of these contributions to the osmotic pressure, the mixing term, the elasticity, and the ionic component, ionic component uh, the last of which is the most complicated with an additional nine terms beyond those listed at the bottom of the slide. The experimental data were fit to these equations by a Monte Carlo guided random walk over the parameter space of the model. And the simplest way of representing the results shown here um, displays uh, what is a truly remarkable agreement of theory with experiment. And on this basis, we conclude that mitotic chromosomal material is a classical ionic hydrogel. And finally, I'll summarize in the manner that is listed here. We know from uh, classical cytological observations, really reaching back almost 100 years, that a chromosome uh, consists of a linear configuration of loops of chromosomal material. What we learn from these experiments, the condensed state is due to collapse of a chromatin hydrogel, which is documented fully in the further work of uh, Beal and Natai that I won't uh, take time now to describe. The important point for the moment, the trajectories of the chromatin fibers are, in result of collapse of a chromatin, chromatin hydrogel, essentially random, which indeed uh, coincides well with the results of the cryo-electron microscope analysis performed by Maya Azubel. And with that, I'll conclude and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Roger, for this uh, really exciting uh, uh, talk. Uh, let me, for people who like to ask questions, could you uh, write it down in the Q&A? I see a number in the chat. Can you help me to, okay. maybe I can try to read them out or you could help me one. Okay. Trying, me, to, trying to find them. No, I, I've lost them. I need to, some people raise the question in the chat. Let me see, I need to find the chat. Uh, let me see. I can see a question. I'll start with that. Yeah, why don't you start with that? I'm looking. Says, what was the maximum spatial resolution achieved? Was aberration correction applied? And if not, why? So uh, what I can tell you is uh, in, the, it, it, uh, in the first instance, uh, the nominal resolution from the observation, of course, is nucleus on level resolution. It clearly goes beyond to that of the DNA and without being a precise or quantitative, uh, Maya has continued to pursue that question by sub-tomo averaging and has quite remarkable findings, which uh, she will eventually report. And I wouldn't like to steal her thunder, but only to say that, uh, uh, as I indicated, uh, for more of the detail, um, 
I think it would be wonderful if you would put the questions to her at your leisure. Uh, in, in regard to aberration correction, uh, I think not, but I, I actually don't know. I see another question. Uh, were you able to see proteins inside the chromosomes? <laughs> well, uh, again, uh, I, the answer to that is, is yes, in a dramatic way, which Maya will have to uh, either tell you about or eventually publish. And once more, I wouldn't like to steal her thunder, but uh, the answer is, a, is a quite remarkably yes. Uh, do transcription factories exist if the spatial arrangement of chromatin fibers is random? In the region that we have analyzed, there is clearly no evidence for such a thing, but it's a very limited region, 500 nucleosomes out of the vast number in a chromosome. Moreover, this is a mitotic chromosome in which transcription does not occur. Uh, it would be a uh, clearly possible one day to investigate um, active chromosomal material. Uh, that poses, however, many challenges, and we have not yet uh, even begun to work on those lines. Okay, Roger, can I ask a question uh, in the arrangements of the, the fiber in the chromosomes? They, they don't seem to have regular patterns. Uh, exactly. and, and, and then also some of them seem to be overlapping on each other. In other words, it, it yes. seems to be somewhat random. So do you have any biological reasons of why such randomness is preferred? Yes, so in the first place, uh, just to respond to the first part, uh, words of the first part of your comment, um, the fibers do uh, appear to overlap with one another, but for the most part, they do not interdigitate. Right. Uh, um, uh, I think that uh, that uh, that what I have said would be consistent with all of Maya's observations. She can confirm that. Uh, the uh, in regard to the apparent randomness, and indeed the identification of the chromosomal material as an ionic hydrogel whose condensation occurs through collapse, as demonstrated in the further work of Beal and Matai. I think the answer is, uh, first of all, I, could, I, I think the answer is uh, really in two parts. Um, the, the first is, in a very general way, that there was no requirement for order, uh, that, uh, that what nature really needs is simple condensation of the chromosomal material and collapse of a hydrogel, a well-known phenomenon, clearly suits the bill, all, all that is needed. But beyond that, if you consider seriously what would be the challenge of regular order, the problem that it would create uh, is it is several levels. The, I've often thought that the paradox of chromosome structure is what we know to be the underlying heterogeneity of the material uh, the, along the length of a chromatin fiber. Uh, there are, of course, many different substructures due to the, different, the, the varying protein composition of the material regions that are constitutively condensed or not, and what have you. Nevertheless, as anyone knows from having seen a chromosome spread or an image of a, of a karyotype, the chromosomes look uh, in a, in, at, at one level more or less uniform. They're all cylindrical. They're all about the same diameter of cylinder. So, in some way, macroscopic order is superimposed on microscopic disorder. But that's a challenge for structural analysis, indeed for understanding, that almost defies description. The solution to the problem is, I think, uh, what we found. Uh, it is sufficient for the chromosome to condense through collapse of a hydrogel against a central axis. I haven't shown the part of the work that uh, Bill and I did to demonstrate 
the existence, the clear existence of that central axis, uh, a, a fiber running down the center, proteinaceous fiber, whose uh, whose existence has actually been a, a, a anticipated by studies done long ago, but demonstrated in the native state for the first time by Biel and Matai. So uh, the answer to your question was that uh, at one level, order was not required, and at another level, it really would have been inconsistent uh, with the structure, underlying structural problems. Fascinating. I mean, one thing struck me is about you being able to relate the chemistry back to the the, uh, the phenomenon in the cell. Do you think these kind of gel hypothesis may be applicable in other area in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm in general? So there um, are, and I know you're aware of. Uh, examples of different kinds of hydrogels that perform important functions. So the nuclear pore um, uses that structure, employs that structural principle uh, for the extraordinary counterintuitive sieving effect of the pore for large and small uh, particles. Uh, the nuclear transport granule for moving RNA from uh, the cell body to the end of an axon uh, employs a similar pattern of organization. Contrary to what many people believe and what you will see uh, in the recent literature, uh, that has an underlying structural basis. It is not true that it is a liquid separated from the rest of the cellular material. It is actually a structure based upon uh, a, an antiparallel beta pleated sheet of which is a fundamental characteristic of an otherwise unstructured protein, which was predicted by Linus Pauling. Uh, the a collapse of a hydrogel, which we observe in this case, is unrelated to that. It has nothing whatever to do with the collapse of uh, proteins to form these functionally important gels in the nuclear pore or in the transport granule. Uh, it is a property of the chromosomal material and collapse occurs in a completely different way subject to different chemical principles, which as I say, were discovered years ago by uh, ex exceptionally uh, detailed thorough analysis by uh, world leading physical organic chemists. Okay, thank you. There are a few questions in the Q&A. Uh, one of the questions asked is, if chromatin, if chromatin is a... a I'll read it. Example, can, yeah, okay. I can read it, I can read it while, so okay. I can help. Okay. I, let me help. Okay. If chromatin is an amorphous jumble of beads on a string, then what is responsible for the X shape of the chromosome? So the answer is the X is formed from two chromosomes joined at the waist. Each individual chromosome uh, results from the process I've described, collapse of chromatin loops against a central axis, which as I mentioned but did not show you, consists of a proteinaceous rod running down the center of the chromosome. So the X shape results, as I say, from two cylindrical chromosomes joined at the center or as it were at the waist. I'm reading another question. Could you comment on the end of the chromosomes, specifically the telomeres and their capping proteins? Uh, in fact, Maya is uh, pursuing now uh, an investigation in the same manner of telomeric chromatin. And uh, that work, which is uh, probably, may, will likely be the first example of an analysis where specific DNA sequences are identified in uh, segmented tomograms. Uh, we hope will uh, be done sometime in the in the coming months. I see here uh, Maya responding uh, to the host and panelists. I hope that others can read her comment. The length of consecutive linkers is not constant, so regular folding 
is geometrically impossible. What Maya means by that is that all of the published regular structures require a uniform length of linker. They require linkers identical in length from one nucleosome to the next or else regular folding as observed in those reconstituted chromosomal materials could not be formed, would not be observed. And I, I failed to mention that when Maya determined the average length of linker, which she did by measuring many individual ones in the segmented tomogram, of course, they vary widely in length. And there are no even, there, there, there are no short runs of consistent lengths of linkers, um, which is the point of her comment. I think she was responding to a question, did you observe any regular pattern of the length of linkers? And uh, so I have read out her response. Okay, good. Uh, there are also questions from a Q&A box. And one of the questions raised by W. Myrna is, is there any hope to obtain more points on the Gibbs energy curve? Uh, say that again, please, what? Any point? Uh, is there any hope to more? obtain more data points on the Gibbs energy curve? You know, the, uh, the, the analysis that we have done uh, was limited only to the individual measurements that I've described for the purpose that I reported. And we, uh, it would be interesting to do, uh, there is uh, a, a, another condition uh, which uh, uh, partially addresses that question. Um, and uh, though the work is not yet been published, uh, I imagine that Andrew and Pierre Jean would not mind my mentioning it. Uh, it's a truly remarkable finding. So Andrew armed now with a, a theory that makes accurate predictions of the state of the chromosomal material could investigate uh, in silico what would be the consequence of further variation of the ionic strength. And what he noticed was if the ionic strength is lowered still further, of course, the chromosomal material continues to expand until the point is reached where on further lowering, it begins to contract. An astonishing prediction. Lowering the ionic strength beyond some point results in a reversal of swelling and the material, the chromatin hydrogel collapses completely on itself. Andrew and Pierre Jean then confirmed experimentally obtaining experimental data as good a fit to the theory, making such a prediction as the fits that I've shown you in the limited data that I presented. That represents then uh, an, an answer to the question, uh, as it were, a free energy measurement under altogether different and really surprising conditions. Uh, Andrew explains that the reason for that behavior is in the absence of any ions, the protons dissociated from the dissociable uh, acidic groups of the chromosomal material then come into play and are ultimately responsible for condensation. An absolutely remarkable finding. Right. Okay, there are still many questions. Uh, let me just raise just one last question and then uh, maybe Roger can answer the rest uh, through email. The last question I'd like to, to raise from one of the audience is, uh, can you comment on the end of chromosomes, especially the uh, telomeres and the captain proteins oh. there? So allow me uh, to repeat that this is, a, a, the first question I think Maya plans to investigate uh, by means of the identification through an approach I haven't mentioned of specific DNA sequences within uh, the tomogram. Uh, and uh, I think that it's an attractive target for the initial study that will localize specific sequences, obviously because the telomeric sequences are highly repeated. Um, but that has not yet been done. Okay, good. All right. 
Thank you very much, and Roger, for well, the well, allow me. Well, please allow me to repeat. Um, I, Maya would be more than happy to answer questions. And for ones that relate to the work by Andrew and PJ, I'm sure she'll be glad, she'll be glad to direct you to speak to them. Pardon me, Wa. Okay, thank you very much, Roger. All right, this is a phenomenal lectures. Uh, and Roger, thanks very much for staying up to speak thank to us you, tonight. Wa. And uh, there are some more questions in the Q&A. If you can kindly respond to them, just type your answers. That would be nice. The audience will appreciate very much to that. I hope Maya, Maya, I hope Maya can see them. OK. And All right, maybe. Will, yeah. OK. Maybe. Able to do so. Yeah. Maya, would you please to do so? And again, thanks very much. And uh, have a good evening, Roger. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Right. Bye. Bye. Thank you again, Roger, for a wonderful talk, very carefully explained, um, even to us uh, non-biological people. <laughs> very much appreciated. Uh, we'll move on now to the physical sciences talk. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Professor Hamish uh, Fraser, very well known in many countries who are doing fantastic work using the new microscopes uh, to uh, solve met metallurgical problems and to design new alloys. And uh, Jen Dion has uh, kindly agreed to be his host uh, for today's lecture. Jen, please. Cool. <clears throat> thanks, Bob. And thanks so much, Hamish, for agreeing to speak at the uh, I think EMX Symposium. Um, I'm very excited to introduce, as Bob mentioned, one of the eminent uh, microscopists in the world. For those of you who don't know, um, Hamish Professor Fraser gra graduated from the University of Birmingham um, with both his bachelor's and his PhD degrees. Thereafter, he was a faculty member at the University of Illinois before becoming a professor at the Ohio State University where he currently um, is and serves as director of the Center for the Accelerated Maturation of Material Center. Like Bob mentioned, Hamish is extremely international in terms of his influence. And besides holding faculty positions here in the United States, he's also an honorary professor of materials and technology at the University of Birmingham in the UK and an adjunct professor at Monash University in Australia, among others. He's also a member of the National Materials Advisory Board and the US Air Force Scientific Advisory Board. He has numerous honors and awards to his name, including being a fellow of TMS, ASM, the Microscopy Society of America, among others. And uh, probably more so than listing his awards, I think what's most impressive is the sheer number of students he's had an impact on, graduating over 52 PhD students and more than a few dozen master's students. Hamish, we're really excited to have you here. Thank you so much for presenting and the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Um, okay, so uh, um, let me first thank um, uh, Bob and his colleagues for inviting me. Um, uh, it's always a pleasure to have something to do with Stanford University. Uh, it'd be good to get to the Rose Bowl, have uh, OSU and Stanford play, but I don't know if we're going to do that this year. We'll just have to wait and see. Um, let me share my screen because I'll get going now with the, with the talk. Uh, which is decided to, here we go. And, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about this, this title actually was chosen by Bob, Applications of Aberration Corrected TEM for Alloy Design. Um, I'm a physical metallurgist by training from Birmingham. And uh, so it's kind of nice having done a lot of microscopy on different topics through the years to come back to applying really, um, not myself, of course, my students and postdocs applying uh, superb, uh, sophisticated aberration credited TEM STEM type work uh, and relate that to alloy design. And I would like to get that across today if I can. Um, I'd like to acknowledge support from the National Science Foundation for part of this work and then the Timec Company and Boeing Research and Technology for obviously something to do with the, the alloys. And you, you'll see I have a, a, a bunch of my guys here. Rajashi Banerjee has obviously gone on, has done fantastic things at the University of North Texas. 
Um, but uh, we, we couple well with the Yungsi Wang's group because I really believe in this business of doing experimental and computational uh, material science and coupling these two together to develop much better understandings of, of what we can do and therefore lead to predictions and predictive capabilities at the end of the day. So let's just jump in here. So I'm going to talk about why do we need new alloys. I'm going to give an example. So this is new alloys, extreme uh, alloys for structural applications. And that's because when you think about making a new alloy, you've got to couple it to some the alloy design with some processing so you can actually um, propose a manufacturing pathway for to, to use the alloy. Um, the need is application of aberration corrective microscopy to identify structural instabilities in beta titanium. And I'll show you what we've done there. And the reason we do that is because these instabilities influence microstructure during heat treatments and microstructure, of course, ends up uh, dictating what sort of properties we have. And then I'll end with then the little section on our alloy development. We've, we've worked with Boeing and, and Timadon. Um, so we have uh, trying to understand the factors of, of affecting alpha nucleation in, in, in these alloys and hence the control of the microstructure. And I said, therefore the control of properties. Okay, so the question is, do we need new alloys. And I'm going to show you an example where um, the landing gear here on this A380 was put through a severe test by this landing. So this is just a nice movie to get everybody in the mood. Severe crosswinds here, that's the problem. Um, the pilot's approaching the one where you can see he's trying to line up the aircraft using the rather extensively. And at the last moment, it tries to put it straight. You'll see it come down and, whoops. Okay, so. So the, the max takeoff weight is 575 tons. And you can imagine that dancing around, that weight dancing around on these landing gear. And uh, so I put these pictures in here just in case the, the movie didn't work. But you can see that the landing gear really took a punishing uh, cold air. And all the yellow parts here in the A380 landing gear are titanium parts. So you can see the titanium took a lot of the, the brunt of that, that forced landing. So do we need out, uh, new alloys? Absolutely, yes, we do. Okay, so. Here's an example based on cash that you can save with these with these uh, with these um, new alloys. So this alloy development should always take the relevant processing method into account. And here we're going to talk about additive manufacturing because that's what the the, the company in this case Boeing is talking about. And like most metal parts in the past, they were manufactured by a conventional method such as forging and machining. Now they want to use additive manufacturing. So. Let's look at this. Titanium is essential to the new Dreamliner, the 787. It accounts for roughly 17 million of the 265 million in costs for the Dreamliner. And Boeing reports that the 3D printing out of manufacturing of titanium components on that, on that aircraft will reduce the cost by roughly two to three million per Dreamliner. So in a typical year, you can produce 144 Dreamliners, and then you can expect about 20 years of aircraft production or more. So reducing the cost of any parts will have a major, major impact over the 20 years, more than $8 billion. So there's a, a big driving force for the companies to do these, to support this as well. In our particular case, we've done our experiments using our lens system, laser engineered net shaping. This unit is 24 years old. It was the first available commercial, first commercially available additive manufacturing machine. Um, and uh, it's got a couple of powder hoppers that led us to variations in composition on the fly. But the main thing is that you focus the, the, the powders and the um, laser beam to a point where you melt the powders onto the substrate and you build this up by repeatedly going backwards and forwards here. And the nice thing about this, the process involves a fair degree of undercooling of the molten powders from the rapid heat extraction. And that's very important when we think about nucleation um, when, it, when it goes solid. Okay, so what is the problem then of using titanium alloys? The problem is we get very coarse columnar grains in the build direction. So here's the, the build direction is here, and you can see these very, very large columnar grains. And this is a very unattractive uh, microstructure because it leads to, and as often, it's got a strong texture to it, and it leads to um, a very large uh, um, 
anisotropic pro properties in the yielded by the material. And so our possible solution was to look for dilute alloying additions to existing alloys. Why existing alloys? Because the companies like to use existing alloys that they know about. So can we change them somewhat so that we can increase their freezing ranges? So that would permit an increased delta T under cooling when coupled with the rapid cooling associated with added manufacturing and therefore may lead to a columnar to equiax transition. So that's what we were trying to do. We're gonna look at possible solution, uh, solute additions that will increase these freezing ranges. And uh, with our new alloys, we wanna solve that problem. That's the first thing. So we wanna not have coarse grain, columnar grains. We wanna have um, a uh, columnar to equiax transition occur. So you have equiax grains. And we want to be able to develop novel microstructures which will enhance the required balance of properties. That's the required matter at the end of the day. So we're going to talk about adding solute to, to, to uh, existing alloys. But first, let's uh, now look at the aberration corrective microscopy effort that we did to look at the structural instabilities in beta titanium. And we're doing that only because these instabilities may well influence, and they do influence, the development of microstructure during heat treatments. So we want to understand what's going on. So for those of you who are not used to titanium alloys, we use this sort of uh, pseudo binary phase diagram. Um, it, the nice thing about titanium, it has this phase transformation from uh, hexagonal close pack to a body center cubic at around about 860 degrees C. And so you can play around with the microstructure that way. The vast majority of titanium alloys are the alpha beta alloys here that correspond to a composition like this. And the new uh, sort of more recent alloys are these metastable beta alloys and they're pushed up in composition up here. And so what we're interested in is what's happening in this area here with the beta phase and the instabilities that can occur in the beta phase that will affect the precipitation of the alpha phase, the nucleation of the alpha phase. So typically the microstructure of an alpha beta today might, might look like this, um, this uh, electromorphic phase on the prior beta grain boundaries and then these Wittmann Steffen plates here of alpha in the grain. It look, and it looks moderately coarse uh, microstructure, but a very, very useful one. Um, metastable beta alloys, given the same kind of heat treatment, will look like this. Immediately, please look at this difference in scale. It's massive. So these are extremely refined compared to these. And so we do say, does this difference uh, suggest a change in the nucleation mechanism? It certainly does to us. And so the ability to develop such a refined microstructure has huge implications concerning the application of heat treatments. So they are very attractive balances of property. So let's take a look at the kinds of uh, instabilities that we're talking about. So this is looking down at 110 direction in BCC. These are the atomic columns that we see. And um, this two thirds 111 longitudinal phonon wave, which is actually the omega phase, will have these atomic columns displaced that way and that way. So they line up now and sort of call it a collapse of the 111 planes um, along the bisector here. And the other one, and because the omega phase is well known, has been studied, a lot of work has been done on the omega phase. Um, the other instability that, you, that, that has been proposed or had been proposed is this 1101 bar 10 transverse phonon wave where these atomic columns here, there, there, and there, all displaced in this case downwards and so you get a sort of a repeating zigzag of the, those columns oops so let's start with the omega phase and see what we did with that this is what's supposed to happen in the formation of the omega phase and then when we use the, the microscopy to look at the uh, hadaf imaging here um, what we should see are these two columns here which are these two here lying along this bisector along there and what we actually see is they're lying along there and so this is actually a partial collapse of the beta planes and something stopping it going the whole way to form the, the the omega and when we take account of the positions of the atomic columns the full collapse would be 0.5 of the 222 interplanar in, in, in spacing and the partial collapse that we see here corresponds to about 0.2 and let's remember that number just for a couple of view graphs so the partial collapse is about 0.2 of that interplanar spacing distance so what metallurgists do, of course, is heat things up. So we heated it up and used the atom probe to look at individual omega particles and show that the, the molybdenum content there had been rejected into the surrounding beta matrix. So the result of our heat treatment is we've lost moly from the omega phase. And now we've gone to a situation where we get full collapse. 
So the full collapse of beta planes within the omega structure, and this is fully de uh, developed, is, is a result of molybdenum being rejected. Now we then wanted to make sure that we were on the right path, so we um, uh, worked with our pals at UNT to, to do uh, first principles calculations, budge elastic band. And so he had, um, Trini had three different structures, one pure titanium, one about the composition of our alloy and one very much more concentrated. And if you look at the pure titanium, this is a, a plot of the, the change in the difference in energy between the beta phase and the omega phase as a function of the displacement. So 0.5 is fully formed omega. And so for pure titanium, the, the free energy goes downhill all the way. And so you're going to say, we'll predict that we'll see omega in pure titanium, which we do not see. So that's a slight problem. But of course, we don't see it because in pure titanium, um, alpha prime martensite forms first, and that uh, frustrates the, the omega phase. OK. Uh, take the very concentrated one that goes uphill in energy all the way, so you're never going to see omega in those alloys, and you don't. So that, that agrees with that. And then the calculation for our alloy composition, roughly, uh, goes like this, comes down to a minimum about here, and then slowly climbs back up. So that would be the minimum case here. And you see that corresponds to about 0.2 of this displacement. So uh, our results, our experimental results, are fitting very well with the, the computational results. And that's, that, that uh, makes us feel pretty good. So we will say the shift of titanium atoms is restricted due to the presence of the molybdenum atoms in the structure. And we have a new insight that this omega phase, which has always been called a, uh, a, a displacive uh, uh, reaction, actually can be mixed mode, both uh, displacive and um, diffusional. So that's, that's right. So that's interesting. So how about the uh, the uh, the uh, the one bar one oh one one oh phonon soft phonon uh, that has been had been proposed and never been seen, and that's what we're expecting to see in the transverse phonon. So in this particular case, uh, we use this particular alloy and we quench the, the sample from above the beta transverse, and this is what we see. And I'm going to put a line in here so you can see hopefully that this atomic column is slightly to the left of the line, that goes through more or less the center, that's to the left of the line, goes through the center, that's to the left of the line, that goes through the center, and that's to the left of the line. So this is actually a piece of this um, um, material affected by that, that, that phonon. And uh, uh, we, because this is an orthorhombic displacement, we, we call this um, O prime, the O prime phase. Uh, just to make sure that you, you you can see that I've done this in, in high mag here, put this line through the, 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 the center of the columns, and this column is to the left, that's in the center, that's to the left, and this goes there, that's to the left, and these two are in the center. So you can see we've got this sort of zigzag um, formation that we expected, and so this is actually the O prime phase. And <laughs> we have no evidence of the O prime influences in the nucleation of the alpha phase, kind of interesting. However, uh, Yu Feng, while he was doing this work, Yu Feng Zhang <coughs> noticed that if you look carefully in, in these high resolution images, <coughs> excuse me, you'll see there's something that's, that's occurring here. And when we magnify that, you'll see it looks like this. It looks like we have a row of columns that are not so bright, and then two rows of columns that are bright. And in this Hadaf image, we know that the, the roughly speaking, the intensity is proportional to close to the square of the um, um, average uh, atomic number. And so there seems to be some ordering of elements here, which once you realize that, you go back and look at the diffraction pattern. And this is just with the contrast inverted here. If these micro diffraction patterns, you can see there's something that's telling you what ordering. You use a few different uh, zone axes and come down to determine that we're looking at an, um, an ordered face center cubic orthorhombic phase here. And that hasn't been seen before. So we call that the O double prime phase. And we have evidence that that does actually uh, influence the nucleation of the alpha phase. So we did then some microstructures that would try and make use of this uh, business of, uh, of these instabilities, particularly starting with the omega phase. And so what we do is this heat treatment, this is temperature versus time. And so we heat the alloy above the beta transverse, we hold it for a short while, and then we quench it. And the quenching to room temperature produces a thermal omega here. So our samples now contain omega. And then we heat treat them, we raise the temperature up to 600 degrees centigrade, and either fairly rapidly or slowly, this is the five degrees C per minute would be slow, 
and we'll see that there's a difference in behavior, but let's see what we get. So if I were to do this at five degrees C per minute, so I'm heating the sample up from here, my omega, my eighth element omega transforms into isothermal-like omega particles. That's what these blobs are here. Uh, that's if I quench the room temperature, I'll see this. If I were to go just 25 degrees C higher before quenching to 375, so just raising the temperature up to here and then quenching, um, I end up seeing, as you can see here, not only blobs, which are the these uh, isothermal-like omegas, but oftentimes attached to them are these short little plates. And these are the incipient alpha plates forming. And we end up with a super refined dispersion of alpha um, uh, coexisting with the isothermal omega particles. So we say that this alpha distribution is directly influenced by the presence of the omega particles. And when we use our um, fancy electron microscope to take a look at this again in Hadaf here, this is the raw image. You can see here is the omega particle here, the beta phase, and here's the incipient alpha. And these two are connected. I can show you the, if you use filtering, just to MFT filtering, just to clean up the image, you can see a very nice interface between the omega and the alpha. And we believe that's, that's gives us evidence that the alpha is, is nucleating on the omega. Why would it do that? Well, then we look at tra transformation. The first is we look at the local compositional homogeneity around these particles. We use the atom probe to do that. And we can measure these compositional changes that occur between the beta and the omega. And then we then look at th use thermocalc to say for those compositional changes, what would be the the uh, nucleation driving force? And we show that there's, or we can find out that there's an, a this compositional inhomogeneity about an omega particle can provide an extra driving force for alpha precipitation between minus one and minus two point four times ten to three joule per mole. So composition itself can influence the the nucleation, but also the elastic stress field around an omega particle. Can be calculated. Here's a, the omega head uh, of the omega coming up to a um, beta. Here's the interface. And as we can see, we have, as we head towards the interface, where we obviously got diffusional changes occurring, we end up with uh, partial collapses here of the structure. So when that's taken into account, so we call that a structurally diffuse interface, we end up showing from these calculations, which is using phase two modeling and Kachaturian's microelasticity model. So the stress field around omega particle can provide an extra driving force for alpha precipitation of about minus 1.88 times 10 to the 3 joules per mole. So omega then is a potent, is, is a really potent uh, alpha uh, um, stabilizer. So what happens if we do the heat treatment a little differently? What happens if we were to, from the from the solution heat treat temperature to slowly cool down to 600 and hold it there and we form then alpha? The, the stability of omega is down here, so we don't. We're doing this in the complete absence of the omega, the omega phase. Uh, we could do the same thing by quenching the room temperature. We'd have eight thermal omega, but then if we heat up rather rapidly here, we uh, we don't give the omega enough time to to form um, the alpha nuclei, and then we form the alpha up here, and we end up with a, a refined alpha microstructure, is what we call it. And if we take these two dimensional images here and we determine the aerial number density of particles, we end up with about two precipitates per micron squared here. And in previous research, we've determined that, that the nucleation of alpha in this case involves a pseudosmonodal mechanism with no influence of the omega phase. So that's yielding a, a, a fairly refined distribution, we put about 2.2 2 precipitates per micron squared for the aerial number density, the, the, the two-dimensional section. Repeat this experiment, but again, slowly as we did, we get that super fine microstructure that we saw. And if we do the same analysis of the microstructure, we end up with an aerial number density of about 40 precipitates per micron squared. And here we say the nucleation is directly influenced by the presence of the omega phase. And that's because of the composition and the, and the um, structure of the omega phase. So we have these two different uh, levels of refinement here. And let's remember those when we go through our uh, alloy development here. So our alloy development, we wanted to, to uh, first of all, we're going to, want to look for these increased freezing ranges before we, in order to choose which uh, solute atoms we're going to add. And so we're going to use computational thermodynamics to predict the increases in freezing range of the alloys. And if we were to take Ti-6-4, the most commonly used uh, alloy, which of course Boeing loves to use, uh, and we'd add nickel, we'd see the th freezing range will increase. So we'll predict that we, we, we may well get a kilometer EQS transition there. When we couple that with the rapid cooling involved in the in the uh, 
at a manufacturing process. Iron uh, increases the freezing range as well, perhaps to a slightly less extent, but we'd again, we predict a, 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 there would be a kilometer egress transition if we were to add some iron. Uh, we can take an advantage using computer is that we can use it to predict uh, rather complicated alloys. This is called alloy titanium 18. You can see here's the composition. And adding iron to that, we can then increase the freezing range as well. So we predict also a kilometer EQX transition here. All right, we have to have one more. We're going to say we don't predict one, and that would be if we add moly to molybdenum to Ti64. And you see, we don't, we hardly get any kind of increase in freezing range. So we'd say we're going to probably predict coarse kilometer microstructures and no CET. So here's a, a backscattered image of the microstructure alloy Ti64. Here's Ti64 with 3.5 weight percent nickel. And the build directions in this direction, so you can see that we form very nice uh, array of equiax uh, grains there. So that that prediction worked. Um, the, the also works with iron. If we add, but if we add iron to, to tie eighteen, a complicated, more complicated alloy, again we see a nice equiax array of, of, of grains. Um, this is now um, titanium. Uh, with 9% moly, we've gone up to 9% and we still haven't got to a, a transition. It's still a very coarse microstructure. And that fit, fits in with what we would have predicted that we would not see um, a transition in this case. So um, if we compare the uh, as deposited microstructures, this is Ti643 nickel as deposited in the additive manufacturing. And what you see here are these alpha plates uh, the, the, the remnant beta in the background here, but these white guys are tied uh, to nickel, an intermetallic phase, and we don't like to see intermetallic phases in these materials because they act as stress concentrators and uh, in brittling phases, particularly at grain boundary. So we don't like that. The tie 6 4 with 3 iron as deposited has quite a different appearance. Uh, there's no, and we've looked right down as far as the TEM level here, there's no indication we have any intermetallic formation here at all. And we're forming these this what, what we in metallurgists call a rather attractive microstructure here of alpha plates in in in, in the, in the um, remnant beta. But these are really quite different microstructures, and so we it implies that there's a difference in the precipitation mechanism between these two, and that's where we come back to think about our in, in instabilities. So the, we we'll make a note here that the alloying additions three and nickel and three iron are above the solubility limit. And hence, possible precipitation in intermetallic compounds in each case is expected. And these are problematic for alloy performance, as I said, and hence the need for heat treatments to try and avoid the formation of, of these compounds. Okay, so let's look at <clears throat> let's look at heat treatments in the case of di 4 with three nickel. Uh, if we solution heat treat at 1000 degrees C for one hour and then quench room temperature, we end up with these very thin plates and most Titanium metallurgists call these alpha prime martensite plates, very thin, uh, left martensite following quenching. We've used our fancy microscope to take a look at the um, using um, e e XEDS in the stem uh, micro to image these these uh, plates. And this is a nickel map, and this is a, a vanadium map. Vanadium says nothing much is happening during during the quench. Nickel has a quite different point of view. It says that uh, as you can see, nickel has been ejected from these plates. And it's concentrated here along the, 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 the boundaries with the, the remnant beta phase. And so during the quench, this uh, as the martensite is formed, the nickel is then diffused out. So it's quite remarkable that one would see that. Uh, nickel is a very rapid diffusion of titanium. It adopts an interstitial mechanism, but still that's, that's, uh, that's quite a remarkable, remarkable result. But again, we wouldn't see this uh, unless we had this beautiful microscope and the very large angle of collection for XEDX which of course Nestor will tell me that his detector is now twice the, or more than twice the angle. So um, we're waiting to get one of those detectors at some point. But still, we, this result is quite, uh, is, is very interesting. So it, we, these, these samples that have been solution heat treated and quenched can now be heat treated. We've done a 450 degree C heat treatment and a 550. The 450 looks like this. So these are just sort of secondary uh, primary and secondary um, alpha formation, no, in, no, um, no uh, uh, evidence of intermetallic formation. But if we do it at 550, that heat treatment, then you can see all these little white blobs are the intermetallic phase, Ti2 and I. 
And so that would say that a pretty hard, uh, hard stop to the use of this at, at this temperature. And it would be interesting to see how long it would take this temperature for the metallic to form. And it consists of basket morphology here with, with coarser primary alpha plates and finer secondary alpha. And uh, in this case, no, no in the metallic, in this case, absolutely in the metallic formation. Okay, so let's take a look at the three iron alloy. And so this is a backscattered image of the microstructure of the alloy, uh, following the 1000 degrees C for one hour, followed by water quenching to room temperature. And I think you can see, all we just see here are grains of beta. So quenching from above the beta transits result in retained beta. And when Ti64 is alloyed with 3% iron, as it is here, it has now become a metastable beta titanium alloy rather than alpha beta alloy. And consequently, you look into the diffraction pattern, you're going to see all these instabilities. Here's the omega phase, uh, the O prime phase indicated here in these patterns. And so, and, and, and the exciting thing for us as, as metallurgists is we can now exploit the very different response to heat treatment that a metastable beta alloy will exhibit compared with the, an alpha beta alloy. And all that we've done is taken the, this alpha beta alloy, Ti64, and changed its, its whole uh, character to being a metastable beta one by adding 3% iron. And that was a, a very, very interesting result. And consequently, if we do this solution heat treat quench and then uh, uh, anneal at 500 degrees C uh, for an hour, we get this beautiful microstructure here consisting of alpha plates in, a, in beta matrix and a very refined. In fact, probably a too refined, it's too refined. If we do it at 700 degrees C, that's heat treatment. So that solution heat treat above the beta transits, quench room temperature and back up to 700 directly. Then you see, we end up with a, a more refined, um, uh, a, a, sorry, of course, a much coarser microstructure than the one at 500. And you can see that by, first of all, there's a, a very significant difference in magnification, which makes us even coarser than one thinks. And also in either of these, we do not see any, any indication that you're going to form this precipitation, this intermetallic compound TIFE. And that's good news too, in terms of uh, eventually making use of this as a, as a real alloy. Well, we recall this result we had a little earlier. This was the two last per micron squared, the pseudospinodal mechanism. We take a look at this 700 degrees C sample and guess what? We get about two last per micron squared as the aerial density here. So we say, hmm, perhaps this is now formed the alpha via this pseudospinodal mechanism. And that's why it's somewhat coarser than, than if it's been affected by the omega phase. The result we had for the, the metastable beta alloy 5553 earlier in the lecture was 40 less per micron squared if we did the slow heat treatment. And, uh, and the, uh, the, uh, we, we said this was due to direct mutation on the omega phase. If we take a look at our Ti643 iron, which has been in solution heat treated, quenched and, and uh, aged at 500 degrees C. We can see that this now has about 37 last per, 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 per micron squared. So very similar to that. And so we are gonna say, still a question mark because we haven't proved it yet, but we say there's probably direct nucleation on the omega phase. And that's, that's why these guys are different. And just to finish up, I'm, I'm not yet able to show you me mechanical properties because uh, that there's some potential use aspect of these. So the companies want us to keep quiet. Um, but, but just looking at the hardness, the hardness of this guy here is about 50 Rockwell C. And if you compare that with Ti64 itself, so this is just with three nickel and some heat treatment, um, it's gone from uh, below 40 up to 50, which is a huge increase in hardness. This goes up to 55, which is even, even higher um, and with, the, the, with our metastable alloy. So our nickel one, according to this in solid alpha beta alloy and the, the three iron to tie six four becomes a metastable beta alloy. And so we have um, a, a lot of opportunities for, for, for heat treating these guys and ending up with very usable alloys, particularly in the case of this three iron. I might add that the tie six four three iron is slightly less dense than the, the 5553, which is very good for aerospace applications. Okay, and I say, no, this is the, the, the significant difference in scale. Okay, so summarizing, uh, we've applied computational thermodynamics to predict the effect of alloying elements on the freezing range of titanium alloys and predicted that alloying with iron and nickel would increase the freezing range. 
And so a kilometer E3X transition should occur during AM processing, and this was confirmed experimentally. Structural and compositional instabilities that influence nucleation in metastable beta alloys have been identified and characterized by the use of aberration corrected stem. And this change in the type of titanium alloy accompanying additions of iron as an alloying element has a profound influence on the type of heat treatments that can be applied to develop novel microstructures. And these heat treatments are designed to exploit the influences of these instabilities that were characterized by aberration corrected stem. And again, I'd like to thank our sponsors for supporting this work. And uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hamish. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I will help moderate the questions in the Q&A, but um, a first question I have is, um, is there any possibility to do like in situ electron microscopy to kind of follow some of these uh, phase transitions or the nucleation and growth as you're heating the alloys up? Yeah, I think that would be uh, that would be something really worthwhile doing. Uh, one caveat is, um, and again, with Stanford's microscopes, you'd be good because you've got very good environments inside the microscope. But, but uh, sort of earlier uh, attempts to do heating, in situ heating of titanium alloys, it's very susceptible to oxidation, and and uh, so you very quickly lose. Well, two things: you get oxidation. So how does that affect what's going on in terms of instabilities? But you also start to lose uh, the ability to see things, especially at high, high resolution. But I think your microscopes are uh, much cleaner, so it'd be worth trying. Cool. Um, could you also talk a little bit about the uh, sample preparation for these uh, alloys with, before you're doing your imaging? To what extent might that influence uh, the structures you see? That, that, that's a really good question. So um, we use mainly use uh, fibbing. To do to because we wanted to try and get the correct orientation for the high resolution imaging. So we we do EBSDs to select the particular orientations that, that we, when we do our trenching and cut out our lift out our sample, then we have very little tilting to do in order to get down the given zone axis that we're looking for. So that's that's generally why we use uh, you you have the fib damage, which is which is very clearly uh, a problem. And then my favorite question to anybody who does. Uh, um, high resolution microscopy is what's happening in terms of uh, relaxations because of the very thin nature of the samples and is that affecting what we're seeing um, um, structurally and that may well be um, and you know you can do experiments where you try and vary the thickness but I think it's still um, I mean, it's still a fair question to ask is our surface relaxation is causing a problem regarding getting accurate uh, structural changes that you're trying to see in the in, in the HADAF images. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Is there any way that your um, experiments could be comp complemented with like a X-ray diffraction, or have has there been confirmation of the microstructure with X-ray? D? Yeah, yeah, I I always get a bit concerned about the uh, scattering cross sections, and, and you know we're looking at very low intensities in the electron case where we've got reasonable cross sections. So if you had a high intensity source, I guess that would compensate for that somewhat. We haven't done that yet, but that might be interesting to see. But they're, they're very low intensities that we're looking at in the, in the diffraction, diffraction patterns. Okay, great. Bob, yeah. take it away. Yeah, I, I had a couple of questions, if I may, Hamish. Uh, one was about the, um, uh, the, ha the uh, aberration corrected machines. So you're using uh, Atom Pro to uh, do the, uh, the composition determination. Uh, why are you using that instead of uh, the stem itself and uh, EDS and tomography? Uh, that, that is the first question. That, that's a very, very good question. And, and it's obviously because we have a little bit more confidence in the, in the Atom probe giving us uh, quantitative data at that scale. And uh, um, I'm, I'm always a little bit concerned about uh, um, uh, if we have a if we have a, a little particle inside a, a matrix, uh, what you know in order to get accurate information, we've got to reduce that 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 thickness. So we have just the particle itself uh, that the electron beam is examining, and I'm not sure if we can if we can if we can hit that or not. Um, but so you can do e EDS tomography. Uh, I'm sure Nesta would uh, would do that with his high collection angle machine. Yeah, he, and he, he, we, we've actually done some of that. Um, 
not on not on things like the uh, O prime or O double prime, but on on uh, on, on coarser scale things. And it's a beautiful technique. Um, down at down at the uh, five nanometer range or so. I that I'm very interested to see. I'll, I'll send him some samples if he wants. <laughs> so. So the other question I had was a, a broader one, and you talked about uh, using aberration corrected TEM for titanium alloys. Now, uh, what are the possibilities for steels? Uh, because that's a rather important uh, metallurgical material but with very fine scale microstructures, and uh, it seemed like um, aberration corrected TEM could uh, have a big role in, in that field. What's your okay. I, I agree completely, and there's this nice uh, vertic uh, phase in the steels, which is, should have all sorts of instabilities, and want to be able to manipulate that. Uh, so I would, I would definitely encourage uh, a very renowned uh, steel metallurgist called Bob Sinclair to, to perhaps have a look at that. Not steels. I'm more a Nightingale person. <laughs> but, uh, it seems to me the scope is just uh, almost infinite. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and 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 it's uh, for us. It's been a, a fantastic last few years with these aberration corrected microscopes. So I have to have to thank um, Harold Rosa and Max Heider and Knut Orban for sort of pushing the aberration corrected business for so many years. It's it yielded a wonderful set of tools for us. Thanks so much, Hamish. And it looks like uh, Nestor is inviting you to come use the X-Pad. So <laughs> before right. you get one, it looks like there's an open invitation to ANL. <laughs> Accepted. <laughs> All right. Well, we're at the top of the hour. So Bob, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. And thank you, Hamish. Um, so at this time, we will just uh, close uh, the formal session and we'll carry on chatting. I think that Roger is in Shanghai and had another appointment, but Hamish will stay online and we'll, uh, we'll stop the recording shortly. Uh, however, I would like to thank uh, uh, Roger and Hamish for a brilliant talk, so quite uh, different as you can see, but using TEM in wonderful ways. Just to announce that uh, next month's meeting will be the first Monday in December and we have uh, Yifan Cheng from the uh, University of California, San Francisco, and Patricia Coyman uh, from University of Cape Town. So we're, we're going below the equator for the first time, I think, uh, in our series. Uh, so, uh, and that will not be the last. So uh, I'd like to then uh, close the, the formal session, thanking our speakers again, thanking Ziwen, Raphael, for all, all the background work, and uh, War and Jen. Uh, for the uh, hosting. Rod, do you have anything uh, you'd like to add? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, I wonder if we can have uh, uh, Maya Asubel to join us as panelists to answer questions on behalf of Roger. Siwen or Ravel, can you? Yeah, I, in, I invited her uh, to join and we can have that discussion here. Okay. Good. Thank you. Well, yeah, send her the invitation. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, uh, discontinue the formal recording and it will be available online in a few days uh, on our website. Uh, and uh, then we'll carry on chit chatting uh, for anyone who'd like to stay. Thank you. Okay, super.